We should be live soon. All right, I think we are live, so I'm going to go ahead and start. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, this is United Medical ACO. Uh, today is October 8th, 2021, Friday. Uh, our first event for uh, today is the United Medical Updates, uh, United Medical ACO Updates. Uh, later on, Tanner is going to join me, and we are going to discuss the news from Delaware, uh, Delaware Health and uh, Delaware Communities. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the event with the distribution group so then everyone knows what's going on. Um, since we have the new time, some people, uh, they don't get the update, so it should be uh, starting right after that. So. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, we are. We have uh, some updates for you, and there is. There is also some new stuff. Uh, there are some new stuff that we are going to discuss. And uh, our main focus for these events is um, where we can reach out uh, one, two, five, 300. It uh, doesn't matter how many people, but if we can reach out and help someone to understand what's happening with the uh, pandemic and also population health, that's our goal. Um, so what uh, we have uh, in terms of the agenda items for us is the number of uh, numbers and the updates from COVID. Tanner is going to help me with that. And then also we are going to discuss uh, some, some stuff from Bill Gates and also uncontrolled diabetes and the depression relations, um, how they are correlated uh, and how can it be managed. We are not going to give any clinical uh, advice, but we are going to actually discuss the um, uh, the main co real connection between the two and why we are actually bringing that up. So we'll be seeing all that. So I am going to ask uh, Tanner to join me. All right. Hey, Kamal, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. Just want to make sure I'm on different mic. I want to see you. I don't know if the video is on. Oh, I have my video on. Uh, oh, I can see you. Are. Okay, now I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with some of our routine vaccine updates. So we like to first get ahead uh, and take a look at the daily doses through the United States as a nation as a whole, what that means for a percent population covered and where we're at on pace for that 75% mark. So uh, this is something, of course, we've been keeping track of for a while. Right now, we are just under actually that 1 million doses per day mark. So we are starting to see a trend up, uh, which is good news whether it be coming into the flu season, coming into the time uh, where more people are gonna be sick, more people are gathering, whether it be for the holidays or for getting back to school, we are seeing that number go back up. And at this rate, we are three months away from 75% of the population getting covered. Now, as you might remember, we've been at three months before, so it's all just based off of how many doses per day and what that will uh, mean for getting us to that 75% mark at this rate. So it keeps getting pushed back, but as long as we can continue to kind of see that increase there, for daily doses per day, we might see that number shrink. But right now we're looking at end of the year, early January. Uh, so what does that mean for the state of Delaware? We like to keep track of where we're at here uh, locally for our community. That's where uh, a lot of our patient population is. That's where we're located. So right now the state of Delaware's population is just over the national average for percent of people covered, um, just at a little over 65%. So we're treading towards that 75% uh, mark here as well. Um, and as I mentioned, that is above the national average, hovering right over that 60% mark. Um, so within the state of Delaware, uh, that puts us at um, a, a good reason why we're starting to see kind of those cases level out. So across the nation, um, what does that actually mean? Um, well, we are continuing to see a trend downward uh, in new cases, which is good. And we're seeing 
new deaths decreased as well. So what I went ahead and did was pulled up one of these heat maps as well. Found this to be pretty interesting just to kind of take a look at where some of those areas where vaccinations are a little bit lower for their populations. You can see that on the right, that's indicated by a lighter color. So the darker color here means more, a higher percent of your population in that state is vaccinated. Uh, and what I went ahead and kind of highlighted some kind of areas of concern right now. So we see that correlation. This isn't anything new. We've seen this before. Um, but right now, some of those, although we are seeing national cases uh, decrease at 23% over the 14-day rolling average, um, we are still seeing some hotbeds uh, in those uh, lower vaccinated areas or populations. And that's what we're seeing here. What you're trying to tell us is that if the vaccination numbers are higher, uh, there are less cases and in this map clearly shows us that, right? Correct, exactly. So just for this, these highlighted points on the right side, you see those lighter colors. That means these states have less of their population vaccinated, right? So then on the left side with the hot spots, the darker color here means a higher um, new case rate. Um, and we're seeing that pretty much lay uh, one for one. Um, so this is something interesting, still related to our vaccines and kind of ties into those areas or those pockets where we are seeing some lower um, percents of population vaccinated. So I went ahead and pulled some information from the Kaiser Family Foundation. So they do continuous surveying for vaccine behaviors, vaccine um, kind of tendencies in certain demographics and populations. So this is just looking at that population of people who um, may or have not received a COVID vaccine yet. And some of the reasons why maybe they might be kind of pushed or persuaded now to get the vaccine. So a big thing that we saw early when the Delta variant was kind of that more prominent variant in the United States, and we saw increases in case numbers, a lot of people started to go get vaccinated then, right, as you might remember. Uh, so that was our leading cause. And then some of those other ones that followed were issues with the ICU populations, uh, those hospitals kind of being strained for resources. That was another reason. And then some of those family and kind of personal reasons are following in there for the three and uh, fourth most, so, most common. Uh, uh, I guess like the, one of the main issue was in the beginning, a lot of people got uh, vaccinated. Then mm -hmm. that number went down. And right. as we are reporting every, every week, um, we have... Uh, Maybe we maxed out to a degree, but then now there are some people are being almost forced to get it. Mm -hmm. And then that force is not just from the Biden administration, but it's also from uh, from their families. Like I know a couple of people, their um, uh, elderly uh, said that they are not going to be with them if they're not vaccinated for Thanksgiving. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a couple of other people, they don't actually let the unvaccinated people visit them at their home. So I think there are a lot of pressure people are getting uh, and that's now the smaller group of people that we have. Um, right. And maybe yeah. by, by Thanksgiving, maybe there will be more people vaccinated. Certainly. I, I think, yeah, those social pressures are definitely becoming more and more prevalent at this rate uh, with people who are still um, unvaccinated. And we saw that that was one of the responses on that graph uh, that was makes up for about 20%. Yeah. Now, um, last week, or was it the week before we... Um, we asked, we, we actually presented that people, kids from 12 and up, uh, they were going to be vaccinated. But I think you have a new update, which mm -hmm. we went over. Go ahead. Right. So what, I just wanted to bring this up again um, in light of some, uh, some other interesting data that we had shared with our providers last night that we'll get to. But um, Pfizer is asking for authorization for the uh, coronavirus vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. So like Kamal mentioned, this is something... Uh, that's been in the news for a few weeks now. Uh, but just kind of uh, refresh or remind what this might kind of, what the impact for this might be, is that is a, an estimated roughly 28 million uh, children in the United States who would then be eligible should they be given the green light. Um, now, of course, it's not going to be instantaneous. We saw early on in the pandemic and throughout the pandemic, there's, of course, a logistical aspect to getting shots into arms. Um, you, at this rate, though, yeah. What do you see the uh, obstacle here that you think the parents are going to be okay to get the kids? I, certainly. I think that is going to be uh, a major obstacle. And we, we saw that a little bit with the previous pediatric patient, our population, right? So when they did authorize for the 12-17, I know um, we had some discussions, some of our pediatric uh, doctors mm -hmm. who did kind of um, uh, bring that up as one of the barriers, right? So we're seeing... Um, it's not necessarily that 
of course, maybe your child doesn't want to, but we're, we're seeing that with the parents. Um, that might not be something that they're or they're ready to do or that they're keeping from their children at that time. Um, so I one think you're right. The, one of the issues that we see now um, is the number of cases in pediatric population actually is increasing and the hospitalization related to those. And I know that you have some updates there. Um, so this may have some impact on that vaccination rate. I okay. think I, I think so. Yeah. And between you can see here just uh, that kind of coincides with when children were starting to get back to school. And I know a lot of school systems, not just here in Delaware, but they are back to in-face learning. Um, so whether it be pressure from the school, whether it be pressure from uh, the state, I, I think that that numbers like this are certainly going to persuade uh, some parents, especially if this does go ahead and get authorized. All right. So... Now, uh, before we go to this, so let's just make sure that we give the background on this issue. So we are trying to uh, look at the vaccination issue from different angles, different aspects. Uh, so part of the issue is there are people who are still uh, questioning the efficacy of the vaccinations or efficiency of vaccinations or um, whether or not they would have some long-term impact on their, uh, in their lives. So all those stuff happening, and we try to read everything as much as possible and follow everything as much as possible. So this, uh, this study that came out of uh, Israel and Qatar, right? So mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, it's, um, I read it differently. A lot of people read it differently and just wanted to kind of see um, uh, what everyone's take is. So uh, because mm -hmm. the way that I look at it is I know what I'm getting into with the vaccine. And what I expect, uh, there's the reality of vaccine, but people may be reading it differently. So uh, tell us about this study a little bit. Sure. Um, I think, as you mentioned, this is coming out of Israel and Qatar. Now, the reason I, we have kind of gotten into some studies um, uh, before that are coming out of that area, just because they were um, some of the first areas to get a vast majority of their population uh, vaccinated pretty early on. So they've been um, kind of been able to get into some of the research of the efficacy and the efficiency of the vaccines um, before a lot of other places, just for to preface that. Um, but what this study that is coming out now is saying, uh, essentially that with the Pfizer vaccine in particular, um, immunity to COVID uh, infections actually wanes uh, about, or your antibody levels uh, drop off um, after about two months. So originally it was suspected that it may be around six months when you might see some sort of, of drop there. But this study is suggesting that it might be closer to two months. Um, so a couple of things that are really important about that are one, um, as we do get into kind of the information here, um, as Kamal mentioned, it really is important to kind of take this for how uh, you're going into it um, first and foremost, right? So some people might see this and try to just use it as information that they're not working. Um, and that's not really what at all what we're trying to say here. Um, this is something, of course, and you can kind of see here in the middle that is expected with any vaccine. Your neutralizing antibody levels do drop off uh, to an extent um, with every vaccine that you're taking. That's just the reality of it. Now, that's not something that we um, are when we first got the vaccine. Personally, we knew that it was going to be effective um, and we knew that it would help reduce the amount of symptomatic COVID cases. And that's why um, it, it was taken. So additionally, what did come out of this uh, study also that I found interesting, Kamal, was uh, although the antibody levels are waning, there's two key things that came out from here. One, um, the uh, robustness of the vaccine to avoid hospitalization and death and serious COVID still um, ended up being highly effective. And two, something else that was interesting, they did have part of their uh, population that had COVID and then got the vaccine. And those antibodies, those people had the longest lasting antibodies out of any other population uh, that was studied. Sure. I think the, uh, what we have to understand is the vaccine is not 100% protection. We all know that. But also what we know is the vaccine does uh, prevent the hospitalization and the severeness of the disease so then we can actually be better protected. Now, uh, we mentioned in the other sessions before, like uh, you can get through this uh, without any medication, mm -hmm. uh, which I personally did, but that doesn't mean that that's the cure for a problem. We have to be uh, preventive uh, in 
these cases. So uh, and I think when we read these studies, some people read them very differently, which we have another uh, couple other topics similar to this, especially our main, uh, one of our main topics uh, with Bill Gates, re related to Bill Gates. So uh, I think people just want to read things in a different way. So when mm -hmm. we saw that study, um, uh, both Tanner and I, we were uh, looking at it as like, okay, well, some people are going to read this uh, in the wrong uh, way and which uh, mm -hmm. that is happening. So our responsibility is to just really understand exactly what, what it is and what we are expecting from the uh, from this vaccine. Now, uh, Tanner, the other thing that we have this year uh, is a little bit more important than last year is the flu season with the flu vaccine. We discussed that last week. Actually, I was trying to get my flu vaccine in the in this event, during this event, but we didn't have, um, it wasn't a good timing. So we'll maybe do that later. So uh, I know United Medical Clinic did two uh, mm -hmm. drive through uh, yep. full events. They went uh, very well. Yeah. I went to the first one. I know the last one was this past week here, Bexwoods, yeah. but I went to the, the first one and it, uh, it went very smoothly. So, but what are we expecting this year from the flu, uh, flu vaccine? Yeah. So we did. We, this, we're going to go into kind of a different situation this year with the flu uh, season than we did last year, right? So last year, um, we saw historically low um, cases of the flu, um, and that was due to a lot of social distancing, still some um, other types of preventative, um, preventative uh, mandates or preventative actions that were taking place by people, whether it had been masking up. Uh, whether it had been kind of avoiding large gatherings or just staying inside and staying away um, from other people for the most part, we did see a historically low flu season. So this year we're going to have a, a few different things going on, right? One, we are going to still be in the pandemic. And two, a lot of that is kind of restricted and at ease. A lot of people are kind of back into their normal habits and a normal lifestyle. So between those two factors, what's going to be really important is to get that flu shot as well, because we're going to see a handful of different things coupled together that could possibly um, cause for a, a rough flu season this year. And that's kind of what the CDC is urging. And, and that's where um, uh, what they came out and said, and they wanted to just reiterate that the flu shot is going to be um, helpful to kind of ease that strain on, on the pandemic, uh, on the hospitals that are already kind of stretched so initially, actually, we reported, if you remember, uh, last year, uh, every year, actually, projected number uh, people who may be uh, dying from uh, flu, uh, especially elderly, that number can be anywhere from 40 to 80,000. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the uh, main points for us last year where people were uh, better with their mask use. Right. And they also didn't leave their home. And with telemedicine, we mm -hmm. were able to manage. In fact, that was one of the silver lining that we were saying that people, elderly, were able to stay home and then still get their uh, care from true telemedicine. And uh, actually, in fact, uh, I believe we are going to be the panelists for um, uh, CMS uh, for Medicare and Medicaid uh, uh, upcoming event for the MSSPs discussing telemedicine. And I think one of the big points for us is uh, how we are able to maintain uh, or provide the services for those elderly while it can be done through telemedicine. And I, in fact, we were able to use that very well last year. Now this year, people, I think they're all bored and they want to be out and uh, they leave home for uh, unnecessary stuff, uh, which I don't blame them. But at the same time, uh, the best thing that they can do is get their vaccine so that we don't have... Um, uh, we don't have these uncontrolled situations, uh, especially with our elderly. So um, now we kind of went over our vaccine updates, and I think uh, with everything that we presented with the COVID uh, since we started, it's been so much information that we uh, present. Some of these are uh, obviously we are just uh, giving the updates. None of those are coming from us, but because we provide services for uh, more than 115,000 people just in Delaware at the primary care level, it is uh, extremely important for our team to understand what's happening uh, with these um, different updates and how, how it's affecting our patient population. So now um, 
you know, the vaccine uh, issue is a little bit uh, juicy. So it's just you know, that there are people who um, who just takes uh, their position based on their politics. Uh, and then there are people for, uh, they take their uh, position based on uh, their religion, background, whatever you want to call it. But it's so interesting how the society is... Um, to a point that, as I would think that we are, we have more access to the information. Uh, we are utilization, misutilization that of that access and knowledge is also increased. So you would think that it would actually help us to understand things better, but no, we are actually utilizing these things to support our uh, misinformation. Mm -hmm. So. Now, uh, Tanner, I don't know if you're a big fan of Bill Gates, but I'm not. So I don't, uh, oh, your, your electricity is out again. There we go. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I don't have any uh, positive or negative feelings for Bill Gates, but I know mm -hmm. that there's a big uh, conspiracy. I'd say the same. Uh, there's a big conspiracy regarding the vaccine and the use, I mean, the uh, reduction of the population. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we just got this latest thing with the 2010 TED, uh, TED right. talk. And uh, the only reason we are doing it is because it was actually shared uh, just, re just this week, right? So, um, well, we, we love these controversial stuff. So we love it. It's like people just, you know, like, in fact, you know, even one of my sisters uh, said that our sessions are boring because we are only doing information, <laughs> serious information. So, well, if we were uh, doing this uh, from the TMZ or uh, some other, uh, like MTV or some other channels, there would be more dirt here, but we can't, this is healthcare. So yes, well, to a point it is kind of boring, but it is uh, essential. So Bill Gates' name comes up all the time with these issues. Um, and then for whatever reason, um, like the people think that he's trying to kill billions of people. Mm -hmm. And Tanner and I, we actually kind of uh, uh, examined what this was. And yeah. even when I was posting this, uh, it's on my Twitter account. So uh, yeah. I was kind of trying to make it more interesting and then put a question mark uh, if he was trying. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. it's just because people don't pay attention otherwise, right? Right. Yeah. And I, I think that this, this one was interesting because I obviously he has been uh, the name's been thrown around for years, I would say, for other sort of uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, and this wasn't actually something I had seen either until just yesterday or the day before. And like you mentioned, with pretty much all the vaccine related information, right, when it's seen out there, it's either taken for just what the face value is or um, most people are going to go ahead and kind of take a headline and, and spin it however which way fits kind of their narrative. So well, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, I just I think it is important that uh, whether it be kind of seem like a silly topic, stuff like this has huge impacts, right? And we kind of started to discuss that last week. I was going to say, because of his name, uh, people are kind of using this as uh, their way of communicating with people that they want to get their support from, right? Uh, support of. So, they, uh, but what we did uh, and what we tell people to do is go to the source of the um, uh, information, the news, and then understand, use your most common sense, uh, try to be as objective as possible. Now, uh, you and I, we actually watched this video yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. 2010. Ted Walk. First, we didn't get it right away, like where people are getting the idea of three billion people are going to die. Yeah, a little confused at first. <laughs> we were confused. So, but uh, after kind of just slowing down the process a little bit and uh, just actually looking at exactly what's being said, we wanted to share this with everyone. So, uh, well, first of all, the guy is not saying that uh, because of the vaccination or by using the vaccines, uh, 3 billion people are going to die. He's definitely not saying. He's explaining something actually at a much higher level. But again, uh, you know how these um, uh, part of the maybe uh, culture that, that is now that people don't want to listen. They just want to uh, like look at the headline and then, they, oh, that's what exactly. he said. That's what, I mean, just read. I mean, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we have 
uh, we have to approach this from the intellectual level. So uh, when we look at that video, and we just want to break that down for everyone. So uh, Bill Gates' idea of uh, his main issue is the uh, how we can actually decrease the CO2, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And just for anyone seeing that, this is part of, I think we kind of cut it off on the bottom, but you can see this is part of that talk. So the whole idea of the TED Talk at the time was, as you can see in the top right, it's innovating, or at top left, innovating to zero. So what Kamal has circled there is that CO2 emission for on a, on a worldwide scale, that's where we need to drive it down to zero. And that's the idea of the conversation. So Part of those pieces, you kind of broke it down into four particular variables. What's affecting the amount of CO2 or CO2 emissions um, on a worldwide level? And people, uh, of course, you can see here is that first one. And that's where a little bit of the confusion and kind of the, uh, um, the I don't know what the word would be, uh, where all, all that hysteria was. They were, they were trying to highlight that more than the rest of exactly. it. Was, exactly. He was uh, looking at uh, this innovating to zero. Now, the thing is, maybe uh, the mistake is this zero. It may not be zero. And, and, and you work long enough with me and you know uh, one of the things that I always use, don't kill the good for perfection or the perfection is the enemy of the good. So mm -hmm. in this one, uh, it's not necessarily going down to zero, but how do we reduce the total, uh, uh, right. total production of CO2? And then he's saying that, well, there are four main elements contributing into this. So that's uh, people, services per person, and energy per person, and uh, CO2 per unit energy. So these are the four main elements, right? Mm -hmm. So from here, uh, then, uh, and when he's explaining, at least that's how I understood, and then we actually, uh, we have the uh, subtitles. The, 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 to make sure we weren't missing anything. Yeah. So they're yeah. right here. So it is his. He did use the word. Um, uh, if we do, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, healthcare and reproductive health services. So he's referring to the first element. So Correct. what he's saying is, as the uh, poverty is uh, improved, so as we are giving more for people and improve their poverty. Uh, to a better level, then we won't be able to reduce the number of people to reduce mm -hmm. the CO2 level. So he's saying that this number one is gone so that we can actually really do that through mm -hmm. uh, people. Right. Essentially, it's the negligible part of the, the four-piece um, equation. Mm -hmm. So with the increases access to healthcare, great job on vaccines, improving reproductive health services, improving healthcare for people and lifting people out of um, poverty and um, uh, situations where they don't have this access to um, good quality, affordable health care, you are not going to be able to get rid of that first element. Exactly. And just from looking at it from face value, and that's kind of reason why I took or why we, we took these pieces out, you can see here he's saying without these things and um, without or with the access to this, then it's going to certainly affect that first piece. But never is he saying that this is the one that's going to go to zero. Or, right. right. So then, and then he explains the second element of this uh, formula, and that's this equation, and that's services per person. And as people have more access, as you are getting rid of the poverty, it means that you are providing more services. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is again, you are gonna, uh, you are losing the second element to reduce the CO two level, right? So right. and then. This is line by line. This is what this guy is saying. So he's explaining that. Now he goes to the energy per person, mm -hmm. um, which also is increasing, um, uh, right? So then right. when it comes to the uh, fourth element, that's the most, um, uh, I'll come back to that, but that's the most uh, impact that he's saying that we can have to mm -hmm. reduce the CO2 level. So. He's giving you a formula, and then he's he's like he's saying that okay, here are the contributing factors of this issue. There are four elements, and these four elements, people, you won't be able to reduce those because we are trying to improve the quality of the people's lives. So the two is service per services per person, 
we are trying to, as we are improving people's uh, quality of life conditions, then we are actually giving them more services. So you lose the second one. And then energy per person is going to increase, right? Because you have the first two happening. So the only way that you can actually really reduce it, one of the biggest impact that you can have, if you are able to reduce the CO2 per unit energy. So that's mm -hmm. what, what the guy is really saying. And of course, like people are just taking this and then putting it in right. the Illuminati jar and let's make it, uh, make this evil person out of that. So that's, I mean, pretty much that's what this Bill Gates issue is. Now, mm -hmm. although uh, we explained this the way that we just did, um, don't just believe what we are saying. Just go and find the video and then watch it yourself and then understand. Now, is it important? It is. If you are making decisions based on these uh, issues, right. uh, th these news, then it is important to understand what you are reading. Exactly. I think that that's the most important takeaway from it because there are so the reason it's in the news right now and why it's having to come back around. This is from 20, 2010. So not related to coronavirus whatsoever at that point. But because the way it's been kind of cycled back through and um, kind of come back up as this headline, that headline is what's being grabbed and is instantly being connected to that. And it wasn't until we go into and just watch, like you mentioned, the, the 20 minute video, you can get the extra context and realize that it's a part of a much broader conversation, not even related to uh, the really healthcare kind of at the end of it. It's, yeah. it's uh, reducing carbon but footprint. That's so. the, uh, the selective... Um... Uh, what's the term that I'm liking? Uh, uh, what's that? The, the selective understanding. Oh, yeah, selective understanding, selective yeah. hearing. So yeah. like they're just, because that's, that's what they want to hear. And exactly. actually, you and I, when we were going through that video, like we had to kind of just go very slowly to see exactly where he even said that, right? So, yeah. and it was how people are making big news out of this is uh, uh, like pretty unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Now, um, other than the uh, Bill Gates issue, uh, we have another topic. Uh, I'm going to I'm bring this up so that we can actually have a discussion with one of our physicians. Uh, and I was thinking kind of maybe we can actually discuss this next topic with uh, one of our, uh, in, in one of our diabetes sessions on Wednesday. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be great. So what was interesting to me is like as we do daily case conferences on the accountable care organization side on the ACO, UMACO, so that's, there's me, Donna Gankul, and Kim uh, from our business development, three of us, and then our nurses who are part of them. So they present cases and then we discuss what's going on. And our goal is to focus on the chronic care management uh, with, the, with one of the highest uh, number is the um, hypertension, then there's diabetes, there's bariatric, the uh, morbid obesity, there's depression, uh, there's uh, chronic uh, kidney failure and the uh, cardiovascular issues. So we are trying to reach out. And last week we shared some of our standard communication with the mm -hmm. patients. So we want to be able to reach out to them. We want to be able to uh, get their attention. But then as I was going through this, um, like almost every patient with high A1C tenor, so all of a sudden I see, um, but we are, we are not clear, we are not physicians. So mm -hmm. uh, for us, maybe maybe it's a, um, it's so obvious for the physicians, but it wasn't for me anyway. And I've been in healthcare for a long for long enough, and then on the clinical stuff, uh, I probably have enough knowledge to uh, finish the residency. But the problem is uh, sometimes the, the data is so clean and the data is so objective, it shows you some stuff. Almost every patient that we have uncontrolled uh, A1C diabetes. Uh, those patients also were struggling from depression. Mm. So, and I, right. I, thought, I thought it was something like uh, I was connecting. I'm like, well, maybe no one knows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so well, then when we Google that you find some information. So apparently there is already this. Research. Yeah, I, I was going to say that the same exact thing happened to me because when you had brought this up uh, originally, I thought, well, that's interesting. I, it's got to be something that um, we might be connecting the dots through some some aha moment in the case conferences. Yeah. But, the moment you do a, a little Google search, you find that there's a lot of information on diabetes uh, and depression, particularly uncontrolled diabetes and depression. Um, as it relates, there's information from 
uh, the CDC, from all sorts of other health systems, Mayo Clinic, uh, and exactly how they're related and why they're related and why we're trying to understand how they're exactly, um, what that correlation is. So um, just like Kamal, I, I started to do some uh, some reading just to kind of figure out, okay, well, there's all this, this body of knowledge already out there about what uh, this correlation could be. And just some of the stuff that I found that I thought was interesting was that relationship between diabetes uh, and depression isn't actually completely fully understood. So we can see a lot of the data, uh, like Kamal mentioned, every patient who seemed to have um, uh, high A1C levels or uncontrolled diabetes did kind of then end up um, having some sort of depression. Um, and there's plenty of data out there that supports this um, aside from our own. So directly from the CDC, people with diabetes are two or three more times likely to have depression than people without. Uh, and 25 to 50% of people with diabetes who have depression do get diagnosed and treated. So there's a, that leaves a 50%. So that other part of those who may be going untreated or who might be struggling uh, without actually being able to, or have reached out to their provider, to their, um, to their dietitian, to someone for, for extra help. So it seems to, we see the data is here and it seems to be a very real, uh, very real problem. So what we are going to do for this topic is um, I'm going to talk to uh, Amy, uh, who's in charge of our diabetes uh, program, and Donna Danko, and then one of our providers, most likely it's going to be Dr. Handal. So maybe we'll just spend one session just for this. Uh, yeah. Because both of them are they're, they're, uh, in their own way. It's a really high-risk chronic illness. Mm -hmm. So when one is uh, affecting the other one, uh, then the issue is just duplicating um, to manage those patients. And I think it's extremely important for us to understand where the problems are coming from, the root of the issue, like going into mm -hmm. the, going, uh, going to the root of the problems. So you don't actually maybe have depression if you can't control your diabetes. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the idea. So we are looking from the data standpoint so that, okay, right. well, what my findings are and then what I'm seeing. So that is uh, mm -hmm. the diabetes. Uh, yeah, just real quick comment on that, Kamal, because that was really what I was finding in my reading and my research as well. So again, of course, not coming from a clinical standpoint, but just based on some of the information on the CDC that uh, what you just mentioned, they had termed as that diabetic stress or diabetes distress, where mm -hmm. that kind of goes in him for if you're uh, someone who is, is battling uncontrolled diabetes or having problems and getting that under control, they certainly um, can find that's where they see that, that correlation. So I'd be, yeah, I think that'd be a really good idea to have that session with um, the di the dietitians. Um, Absolutely. Early on there. No, um we were going to have uh, our uh, Brandwine Valley um, SPCA people today, mm -hmm. but uh, they are rescuing uh, our four legs friends, our uh, <laughs> animals, so they couldn't make it. Uh, it will happen in the next couple weeks, perhaps, but mm -hmm. uh, we just want to remind people that we do have uh, from Brandwine Valley SPCA Bark on the Board. So this is an event uh, at, uh, at the beach down in Rehoboth, so um, it's open for everyone. Um, if you have time, and this is next, not this Saturday, but next, October 16th. Correct, yep. Yeah, to 1 p.m. So hopefully uh, a lot of people will be there to support this event. Um, mm -hmm. Our partnership with SBCA, uh, with Brandwine uh, Valley SBCA, is uh, extremely important for us as we are trying to help the, our population, we are also trying to help our uh, animal population and uh, the work that they do is even more difficult than uh, what we do on the uh, other side, uh, Tanner. So uh, when you are dealing with um, animals, it's a little bit more difficult uh, to understand them and to try while you are trying to help, help them, they may actually not understand that. So then right. it, it's a pretty uh, unique problem. Uh, it has all its own pro issues. But I think this team of Brandwine Valley SPCA, they do an amazing job. And I'm so happy that we did uh, commit our time and uh, resources for them. And hopefully this event will turn into a really nice event. We also have an event, uh, we didn't want to forget that uh, YWCA um, Annual Breakfast uh, United mm -hmm. is one of the main sponsors. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know if uh, we mentioned yeah, that. That will be next week, I believe, on Tuesday. Um, I, I didn't have anything in here, but if you have some information on it, we should certainly bring that up. So I'm going to actually just bring that up very quickly. Mm -hmm. And hopefully for the Brainy Wine event, maybe we could have someone on next week to kind of just talk about it, give it a little more information. Otherwise, it'd certainly be good to have them on afterwards to kind of talk, discuss the, the positive impact and how it went. Yep, so this is the uh, YWCA event. It is on October 13th, it's a Wednesday actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if they finished their videos, but I, I believe I'm part of the hopefully. Uh, I was, yeah, so if, I know you might have, of course, a little more information on it, Kamal. I know that this is something since I've been here, at least um, we've done this every year. Uh, if you want to talk about a little bit uh, so what it is. Been, we've been doing this since 2010. Uh, so mm -hmm. they, they, this is their event. Uh, they, they've been doing it for a long time. But as United Medical, we started participating and personally me, uh, Kamal Arkan, started participating with them as of 2000, uh, actually 2012, I believe. Uh, so, and then since then, we are putting in a lot of effort to support them. And I do believe that it is one of the um, best uh, charities um, that I have seen in, in terms of the meaningful impact that people can uh, uh, get the proper help and then they can move on with their life. Uh, I think YWCA is doing an amazing job. So actually this year we are gonna do something different with this and we are gonna have a watch party at United Medical while some of us will be at the actual event. So, uh, and our, uh, my executive assistant Ann Wilson is organizing uh, this watch party. And actually I do wanna also acknowledge uh, her uh, support and her efforts. So she works with me directly on these and she does a lot of work uh, for this project. And I believe uh, it will be a good um, turnout all together and then uh, we'll be hopefully we'll be part of this long term uh, and every year we'll be doing it as much as possible. So um, that's uh, pretty much what we have today. Our bariatric uh, Friday event is uh, with Dr. Erga that's going to start in 17 minutes. So um, uh, and hopefully everyone will have a great weekend and then we'll see you soon. Tanner, thank you for joining me today. Sure, thank you.